Welcome to Information Service Engineering, lecture number 11, Basic Machine Learning Part 2, and this is the notebook for the decision tree section. So, welcome to the decision trees examples collaborative notebook. Okay, what we are going to do here is on a live example. So, what we are going to do is we want to do some weather prediction on kind of data that we get from the internet, and we do this with the help of a decision tree. So, Let's try to start. Uh, as always, we have to do some imports. So we know uh, we need here the scikit-learn or we use the scikit-learn library. And of course, what you probably already have seen. So we need training data set and test data set. And there is a, a method to, to help us with that. So it's called train test split, which creates according to our likes a train and test split of our data set. Uh, we need, of course, the models of type tree. We also take them from um, scikit-learn. There are decision tree and other um, models in there or variations of that. And uh, then we need some matrix. Of course, we want to know an accuracy score. And later on, we also need the confusion matrix because we want to look at the results that we achieved. Since we are looking at some kind of data, in weather data, we need the pandas library to do some nice analysis and uh, visualization there. And of course, um, we want to plot something like the confusion matrix or later on also kind of a heat map. And for this, we need the matplotlib. Okay, and Seaborn for the heat map. So these are only for visualization. Um, I, if you're interested in these libraries, we have linked them up here and then you can come to the website and get more information about all of the available classes and methods you have there to use and objects you use there from these libraries. Okay, so what are we going to do next is we will load a data set with weather observations, including the information which is important, whether it has rained or not on the next day. And of course, we will use this with the data of the day today, whether it has rained the next day or not. And we do this kind of prediction with the help of a decision tree classifier. Okay, so we will load this data from GitHub here. This is the address where we get the weather prediction data from. And we read this here again into uh, a pandas data structure. So we read here the CSV data and we will look at the first five rows again here with the method head five and you will see how this data looks like so you see we have here uh, lots of columns so we have minimum temperature maximum temperature rainfall evaporation sunshine wind gust speed wind speed at 9 a.m wind speed at 3 a.m also two types of humidities pressure the clouds the temperature whether it had rained today uh, and and so on so there are lots of interesting data that we want to make use of to get a bit more insight, we use the info method here and we see there, okay, this is, yeah, a lot of data. So at least uh, 56,000 measurements we can use here. And overall we have 27 columns. Of course, consider, we of course want to give you here again, a live but a toy example. 27 features are a lot for a decision tree. So you would have probably 27 levels for decisions to make. And for that, it could grow immensely. And of course, most likely all using all of the features brings up also lots of noise and um, some of the features are irrelevant or redundant. So to find out which features might be useful, so we want of course to skip a few of these features to make the problem smaller. What you can do is to see whether these features somehow have a correlation with your target function or your target output. Your target output is here whether it has rained tomorrow so what we are going to do is we want to uh, make a heat map which indicates the correlation of the single features. So this is what we are doing here in the next code section. We want to plot here a heat map with our weather data and weather correlation data. Okay, so let's do that. And as you see here, it's 27 by 27. So this is a rather huge heat map. Uh, we are interested here in uh, rain tomorrow. You see it here in the lower part of uh, the of the of the of the matrix, and uh, you can see here indicated by the color that the interesting colors are of course somehow greenish or reddish. The yellow ones 
or light yellow ones are, there is almost no correlation in neither direction, which means these are the first skipping candidates and we should then focus on the other features where there is more positive or negative correlation to exactly our rain tomorrow section. This is what we are going to do then here also in the next code section. So what we are going to do is we want to drop lots of, as you see here, these uh, columns so that we come up then with a much smaller number of columns. And of course, we do not want to take all 56 thousand uh, data set points so we reduce for the toy example um, to only 10,000 points because of course you don't want to get bored during the training phase uh, of, of the model when watching this video of course you can later on uh, of course skip exactly this line here when we drop the first 45,000 uh, rows and you can of course play around with that number what happens if we have 20,000 uh, examples what happens when we have 30 or even when we have 60,000 examples play around with it so that might will be nice so okay we skip again the stuff and you see here we start then with 45,000 and end with 56,000 which means we have in the end around 11,000 examples and we only have in the end then nine columns so this is completely sufficient for, for our use case okay if you want to know a bit more about the features we have here, then again, it's also probably important for feature engineering, we can plot the histogram for each single feature we are looking at. Okay, so let's have a look here. We have rainfall and you see, yeah, there are many days with low rainfall and only um, a small number of days with heavy rainfall. Sunshine looks quite like a normal distribution. So most sunshine Days or measurements are between here, what is it, nine and 10 hours, probably. No idea what that measures. And here we have the wind speed gust. So you see also kind of a normal distribution. Also, like the humidity, the pressure. Clouds at 3 p.m. This is also interesting kind of distribution. Then we have here temperature at 3 p.m., rain today and rain tomorrow. You see rain today and rain tomorrow. It's already looks similar. So probably rain today is. As the, of course, this is uh, uh, metrological lore. If it rains today, then it's also likely to say that it rains tomorrow. Okay, but let's see whether this works out or not. Next thing we have to do is, of course, we have to split this data set into first the feature part and we have to separate the column rain tomorrow. This is what we are doing here. So we say here X is everything but here the column rain tomorrow. So we drop this column. And Y then is then simply this column, rain tomorrow. So we have then two features, uh, uh, let's say um, data sets X. This is uh, 11,000 something examples with eight columns. And then Y, this is the target function, same number of rows. And of course, it's only one uh, column in that sense. Okay, further split we have to do. Both of them have to be also separated into training and test set. So, and this is here, train test split. We take, we have imported this in the beginning. You, you remember that. And of course we want to here uh, uh, take X and Y. So X I used in a capital way because this is a vector of features and Y is our target function. And this is again what we do. So we do X train and X test and Y train and Y test are then training and test data set for X which is the feature set and Y, which is the target function. So you see here the training test split is then here 8,500 training data, 2,800 test data. So this is 25%. Uh, so we use here as a test set. Okay. So next we come to the decision tree classifier to make predictions, which means we use here tree which we have imported and we want to use from tree the decision tree classifier. And um, yeah, this is then our classifier CLF. And then of course we want to fit uh, the training data for that. This is uh, X train and Y train. We train it with that. And then of course um, we can compute the prediction, which is the prediction on the training data and the prediction on the test data. So the Y train prediction is the classifier predict everything on based on the X training data and the test predictions is everything predicted based 
on the test data. So this is the next thing we do here. So you don't see any output. Of course, we have now to visualize the stuff. First of all, we can visualize the decision tree that we have created. If we want to do this, this, this takes a lot of time. So this is one to two minutes. So therefore, I didn't do it here. I, I prepared already uh, the, the, the final picture for you. Simply click on it and then you see here uh, this decision tree. Usually then in these little boxes there, you see also uh, what is exactly the, the, the variable on, on which we have split here. And then you see also uh, on the end, uh, you see here whether it rains or not. So then it's rain or not rain in the end. But it's rather huge as you see here. So too huge to visualize it completely and to make sense of it. The only thing we see, yeah, there's a lot of things going on. However, we want now to see how well it really performs because we haven't looked at the prediction so far. For this, we have a little helper function here defined for to plot a confusion matrix. There we use again kind of a heat map from Seaborn library. And uh, this is only to make clear, you know, uh, which has predicted correctly and wrongly. So to see um, false positives and true positives and, and stuff like that. And um, so, you know, confusion matrix also from the first section of uh, the lectures, the first part of the lecture, we did this already in NLP. And yeah, for the evaluation, of course, we look then first always on the training data set, accuracy, precision, recall, and F1 measure, and also then for the test data set. And we print for that the confusion matrix. And we see what's going on there. So you see here, so I want to print here the accuracy score, score recall, F1, and so on. And this first for train, then for test. And then I plot here the confusion matrix first for the training data, then for the test data. Training score, let's look at that. Of course, F1 measure is one because it's a perfectly fitting decision tree. So we make the correct decision for everything. This is how we constructed this tree. And as you already know, this might overfit, which we see clearly if we are using this kind of tree on the test data here, because you see it ends up with an F1 measure of only 56.6%. So looking at the confusion matrix, of course, here in the training confusion matrix here, um, yeah, wrong predictions, we have here always zero. And then for the test confusion matrix, you see here that, yeah, this is quite something. So out of our set of 2,800 um, data, uh, feature data, we have more than 200, more, more than 500, you can say here, uh, wrong predictions. Okay, so clearly this thing is overfitting. What you can do, for example, <clears throat> is, and also to, to let the, the tree grow less and therefore save some of its generalization capabilities, you can do so-called pruning. So there is so-called pre-tuning and post-pruning. We only want to show you here a bit of pre-tuning and what you can do there is you can in each, uh, decision that you make then in, in your decision tree, you can sample different parameters. Like for example, you can do decisions at specific depths or you can say uh, if, a, if a specific minimum or maximum number of samples is required to split at an internal node or to split a leaf node in the end. So there are different pruning strategies. This is already no, uh, you know, no more part of the lecture. This is only to show you how then to optimize the stuff later on. You can read on that, of course, in, in the textbooks. What you do there in pruning is you try out many parameters and then you do kind of a grid search for those parameters to find out, you know, which one works best. And this is exactly what we are going to do here. So this is then a randomized search that we do here and a grid search that we need. And um, yeah, we do again the decision tree. And um, for that, we do here a grid search with uh, different kind of parameters that we have specified over there, like the max depth goes from two, four, six, seven, then number of splits, samples are two, three, four, and then uh, we have the, uh, the splits at the, the leaf node, and it's one or two. And then, yeah, simply do this and see then what's the outcome in the end. So with this kind of pruning and now we have a smaller tree created and you see here the results if we do here then the evaluation again so the model is then we simply choose the best estimator here from our grid uh, based on grid search 
and then uh, we do these predictions with the best estimator we find here and then uh, we are trying to look at the scores for the training data and for the test data again what you see here or what you can see due to uh, the pruning of course this tree is not perfect anymore also not for the training data because we made some you know yeah random decisions in there and therefore in the end here the f1 measure then for the training tree is only by 67 percent however you see here the effect on the test data that of course uh, the decision tree didn't know before was immense because here again the f1 measure has been increased and now it's not 56 percent anymore it's already 64.8 so this is an immense increase here so now the tree is capable of doing much better generalization you see here so the number of uh, wrong decisions here dropped already so it's not even 400 anymore okay this is quite nice again we can uh, plot the tree so i did it here again and as you see if we scroll down now the tree looks much more symmetric and of course it has a much smaller number of nodes if you look at that so it's uh, smaller therefore pruning you might do even better so there is another let's say version more robust version for for decision tree algorithms which is so-called random forests random forests is a so-called ensemble method which means you grow many classification trees different classification trees for a given problem and in the end you uh, choose or make a decision based on a majority vote of all of these trees and this works quite well and usually um, this is less prone to overfitting because you create so many trees here with the random forest classifier so to try out the random forest classifier what we have to do here is um, we have from scikit-learn to go to the ensemble learning methods and there we import the random forest classifier and here we uh, create a forest model so with the random forest classifier and we say okay we restrict to 150 estimators this is the number of trees that will be grown there of course we try to do everything as parallel as possible so therefore number of jobs is minus one and then we fit our training in uh, our data into it which is the training data for x our features and for our results and then we do the predictions for the training data as well as for the test data as we are used to do this and then we look at the scores so let's do this now and you see the result again the training score we have a perfect score there of course the best possible decision here of course in the end results in a in a perfect tree however the test scores you see here on the unknown data are much better than for a single decision tree but here of course no pruning so far has taken place so it's uh, in the same range like pruning so here it's 64.3 5%. So this is also a rather good result, as you can see here also from the confusion matrix. Okay, this means based on the data we have, we can already predict whether it rains or not with an F1 measure of 64%, which corresponds to a, an accuracy from, of more than 87%. So this is already rather high because, yeah, you don't make so many wrong, let's say, choices or decisions there. Later on in the lecture, we will also try out exactly the same problem with the help of neural networks and see whether neural networks are able to achieve an even better result based on the data we have here. But this then will be subject of one of the next lectures.